relations. And many students of public relations who go on to careers as practitioners have learned your theories. Do you have a sense of how much your theories are impacting the practice of public relations today? Well, I think it depends on whether I'm feeling optimistic or pessimistic on a, on a given day. Um, I hear a lot from people who say that their career has been influenced by different theories, the two-way symmetrical model, for example, or the public relations and strategic management. Um, so when I hear that, I can be very encouraged. And, but then oftentimes when I read about what PR people are doing or I read their blogs and so on, and they seem to be doing the same old things that they did years and years ago, I think, you know, this is hopeless. Uh, but I think by and large, the, the theories have made an impact on the practice. But it's in a way that you might not think of, in the sense that I think it was Bruce Harrison told me at one point, and Bruce Harrison is a, you may have interviewed him already, but he's a well-known environmental public relations practi practitioner. And he said, no, what, you know what you did was provide a name for something I've been doing for many years. So I don't think the theories are totally unique in the sense that I made them up without any relationship to practice because a good theory is always based on reality as well as conceptual thinking about it. So if I look in you know, the symmetrical model, for example, we found many times is actually practiced in, practiced in different ways and it's, it's quite effective. And it's a name that it's been given to things, that, again, that people haven't, uh, haven't uh, had a name for before. So, um, and then I look around the world. I think it's the theories have had a great impact on what is taught in public relations, perhaps more than what is practiced in public relations. But I've traveled in somewhere between 40 and 50 countries and lectured to people and the students and practitioners and so on, and I'm always amazed that people know the theoretical language and they're using it, and I think that, the, that it's being practiced a great deal. I like to call these the symbolic interpretive approach versus the strategic management approach. And my approach is essentially the strategic management approach. I believe that the role of public relations is form, uh, first and foremost to bring information in from outside the organization, from members of publics or stakeholder publics, so that management makes better decisions. And the role of public relations is essentially to help management make better decisions. So that's the strategic management role. The symbolic interpretive approach is more, how can I change the meaning that people ascribe to what management does so that it makes it look better? And I keep seeing that quite frequently. I think management would like to behave in the way it would like without thinking of the, the impact on publics. And then they think a public relations person can come in and craft the appropriate message and make, the, make it look better than what it is. And uh, I see a great deal of that, particularly in, in marketing communication and and uh, persuasive aspects of public relations in that it's very hard, very difficult to burst that bubble in a sense, to break into that way of thinking that public relations is a way to make organizations look good when they're doing bad things or uh, make them make what they're doing appear to be in the interest of publics when it not actually is. Can you talk about how your theories apply in the age of social media? And I think about symmetrical, uh, your, your symmetrical model, for instance. That's very interesting. I just saw a blog in, in some place in the UK this last week that said, the Grunig theories need to be reevaluated now in the age of social media. And I thought, I looked at that and I said, no, they're more applicable now than they ever were. In fact, what digital media, social, 
uh, digital media in a broad sense. I think digital media are broader than social media. But they've made the symmetrical model inevitable, in my opinion. I just don't see how any organization can try to communicate with publics without listening, without engaging in dialogue, without uh, trying to understand how they see their interest when organizations make decisions and behave in certain ways. Because uh, there was what I called the illusion of control before, that public relations people and organizations, and in general, the organizations they work for, seemed to believe they control, could control the message that would go into publics and that would control the way they thought about their organization. I never really did think that was true. People were able to talk to each other and they got information from different sources. They weren't restricted to media or to advertising or what else. They had their own experiences. They talked to other people. They read other sources of information. But it's now the, the digital media just makes it much easier to do that. So if you want information about a product, for example, um, I'm at the age now where I use a lot of, of medical <laughs> problems, <laughs> medical products, and I don't take anything without doing an internet search first. And the person, the, the site I'm least likely to trust is the one that's coming from the pharmaceutical company. Um, same way I wouldn't buy a dehumidifier for my basement without seeing whether people say it breaks down after a year. So it, one, the control has, it, I think control was always in the hands of, of people, uh, you know, individuals and publics. Uh, but now it is much more in their hands because you just can go anywhere to get information and it's, you're not restricted to what uh, organizations choose to, to make available for you. And so this symmetrical model basically is a model of, of dialogue and it's a model of, of looking out both for the interests of your organization and for the publics that are affected by the organization. And it's much easier to d it's much easier for an organization to find out how publics are affected because they can simply go online and do searches and, and read blogs and find out what people are saying about how decisions are affecting them. So I think that uh, the new media make it very interesting, very interesting to practice public relations because it's, um, I think it's going to be much easier to convince management that they have to be more open in, in communicating with publics and that you really can't use the symbolic interpretive approach to try to put out an interpretation that you want people to hear because they'll easily get a different interpretation someplace else much about the ethical challenges that are raised for public relations practitioners as a result of the rise of new media. I've said many times that that the symmetrical model is inherently ethical. Um, an asymmetrical model is not necessarily uh, inherently unethical, as I've been accused of saying many times. Uh, but to practice an asymmetrical model, you have to be able to prove to yourself or to others that what you are trying to persuade someone else to do is actually in their best interest. And it, it may not always be because I think there are oftentimes efforts, I, I've talked about convincing people to smoke, to use guns, to do all sorts of things that are, are not in their best interest but in the, the person who's doing the message really thinks it is. So with the symmetrical model, you leave it open to dialogue and you don't try to decide for the other person what is in his or her best interest. So that uh, the, it's what a, a theorist, uh, Ron Pearson, said several years ago, the obligation of dialogue. That ethically you have an obligation to engage in dialogue with your publics whenever the organization that you represent has some kind of consequences on the public or publics. So the consequent, there are two versions of ethics, consequentialist ethics or utilitarian ethics, which says that, you know, whenever you have negative consequences on someone, then uh, you should examine whether that behavior is, is good. 
Uh, the problem with consequential, consequentialist ethics is that sometimes a behavior has good effects on one party but not on the other one. So how do you decide which one gets precedence over the other one? Uh, that was always the problem with utilitarian uh, ethics, the greater good for the greater number and so on. But, but at least I believe in utilitarian ethics because of, of the concept of consequences. I think that's the most important term in public relations. Uh, a public comes into existence when an organization behaves in a way that has consequences on the public. And when a public recognizes those consequences, then it begins to think about them and to communicate about them. This comes from my studies of John Dewey when I was a graduate student many years ago. But then there are the limitations of consequentialist ethics. So if you add uh, into that deontological ethics, which basically says, uh, what are the rules that you could follow that would make, uh, if you follow those rules, uh, your behavior or your actions would be ethical. And the rule is the obligation of dialogue, which doesn't mean that you make decisions for others or, or you, you always do what is probably the the best thing or the, the thing that's best for everyone, but you leave it up to dialogue and people can you come together and uh, the way you behave may or may not be the most ethical thing, but at least you listen to the other party and you've engaged in dialogue with them. So anyway, my theory of ethics is essentially whenever an organization behaves or is thinking of behaving in a way that will have consequences on a public and the consequences bring about the public, then you have the obligation to engage in dialogue with them. So then the question is, what do you do after the dialogue? Do you do what they want you to do or what do you think is you would like to do or what is right? And that's never easy to decide. But then you, one has to engage in some kind of social reason to think through, you know, and now I've listened to the other side, I've thought through our side, and I've made a decision based on the best information I have available. The other, the other party, the public, may not always agree that this is most ethical, but at least it, the, the other party will have uh, had a part in that decision, and so it, it is going to be more ethical than if you didn't make that decision. So now if you apply that to social media, I think the obligation of dialogue, well, you can find out what kind of consequences you're having by doing environmental scanning, by, by looking at what people are saying on the, ma on the social media, on the, the digital media, about the effects of your company or your organization's behavior on them. And then you can engage in dialogue, either by, by joining into blogs of which they may be a part, or setting up your own blog or your own uh, Facebook page or any way in which you can engage in dialogue with those publics. I think that the, the biggest ethical challenge comes with the concept of lurking. You know, when can you listen in on people when they don't know you are listening in to them? Uh, and that I'm not sure if anybody has an easy answer for, except that uh, I think that if you're going, that you need to reveal, again, making it known that you are listening, that you're present, that you're part of the conversation is an important part of that ethical challenge. So uh, I think there are times when we simply want to listen in what, what publics are saying without actually saying, well, I'm here from XYZ company and I'm listening to what you're saying. Uh, I think there are times when we can gain information in that way and, and take it to management and so on. But before we ever quote them or, or do anything with that information, I think we have the obligation to reveal to those parties that, that we've been listening in and we've taken part in the conversation. Something else that strikes me that, that social media raises in terms of ethical challenges in, in the model that you've talked about um, is this idea that the dialogue that you're listening to is much more public. Everybody can listen to it, right? right? right. And so then the decisions that are made after you listen are, can be viewed by everybody through that right. prism. Right. Uh, and that just um, 
does that ratchet up the ethical stakes? Well, good friend and former colleague Mark McElreath, who taught originally at the University of Maryland with me and then at Towson University, wrote a book on ethics. And, and his first rule of ethics was, if, if you make this decision, are you willing to go on national television and announce it to everyone? And that's, I think, <laughs> that's a very good rule, because if you cannot make that what you're doing uh, known to those that are going to be affected, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Or if you try to engage in a behavior without saying you're doing it, uh, somebody's probably going to find out and they're going to reveal it on digital media. So it's going to come out whether you like it to or not. So the question is, uh, with social responsibility, if I'm making a decision, if management is making a de decision that carries a great deal of risk for a public, and I can't announce that risk to the public, then I probably shouldn't be making that decision. So I think the the social media then give us two things there. It, it really makes everything transparent whether we want to or not. And if we try to withhold information from people, it's probably going to come out. But then it also gives us, um, you know, it gives us the a means for talking about potential decisions before they're made. Um, and then making the decision with the best information. Now I stop here for just a minute because there's something happened at the University of Maryland just in the last couple of weeks that uh, Maryland decided to join the Big Ten Conference. Uh, and the entire decision was made in private. <laughs> And as I understand, now all of my theories would say this is a terrible mistake. And from what I read about this decision, uh, it wasn't totally in private. The, the Washington Post ran a very lengthy article about it this weekend. Um, and the president of the university consulted with the lawyers, of course, <laughs> but also with primary major donors, with some board of regents, but not all of the board of regents. And with uh, coaches, you know, many people who would, who would be affected by that decision before he made that decision. So in a sense, he was gathering information. Now, there was a non-disclosure agreement made with the Big Ten Conference that they couldn't say anything about this before the decision was made. So what would have happened, ideally, the whole thing would have been vetted on the Internet and discussed, and, and there would have been hearings, there would have been discussion of all of this, but I suppose there's a competitive advantage involved here. So this gets into very difficult kind of area to how much, how open can you be when, when uh, there's, you know, when a decision is going to, might be adversely affected and it might not be possible to make that decision if it's going to be open again. So I'm not quite sure how that, whether that was, decision was made properly. It, it, there's even been argued that it violated Maryland's public uh, open meetings law because it, the vote was taken without having an open meeting and so on. But I think that's a very, interesting ethical question here that people should think about. I, I can see both aspects of it. On the one hand, I think it should have been much more open and much more dialogue. But then on the other hand, it might have not have been possible to make the decision if that had actually been done. So. Uh, it sounds to me as though the Maryland case will, will uh, make a great case study at some point. At some point, <laughs> I think. Um, speaking of case studies, and, and you talked earlier about uh, your travel, and of course you've been a leader in the public relations education field for, for uh, decades, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering, how should the teaching of public relations be different today than it was a decade ago? Well... If I, if I were still teaching, there are two aspects of public relations education. One is the theoretical aspect of it, and the other is the implementation of theory. And actually, 
I would teach public relations theory exactly the way today, the way I taught it 20 or 30 years ago, although I wouldn't teach it exactly the same way because I know more than I did 20 or 30 years ago. I've done a lot more research, so every year uh, that I taught public relations theory, I would teach something a little bit different, although the basic framework, I think, was the same. But as I added pieces, uh, I've written an article I called Furnishing the Edifice. And the idea is the edifice meant I framed the house, I, I put the pieces together, but then there were a lot of details that need to be worked out. So there are certain theories that I've developed, the situational theory of publics on the nature of publics. I developed that theory when I was doing my doctoral dissertation and as part of a term paper in a communication theory class at the University of Wisconsin. And I tinkered with that theory over the years, but the basic framework is the same. And I've worked with a, a former PhD student, uh, Jung Nam Kim, who's now at Purdue University, who's made substantial changes in that theory. So it, it would change, but again, it would be the similar sort of thing. The symmetrical model, the strategic management approach, all of those, I think, are as relevant today or even more relevant than, than they were some time ago. And particularly, as I said, with, with new media, uh, that there, which the new media, I think, impact the, the techniques, the, 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 act, you know, the actual programs and activities that one does in public relations. But I think the, the theory is essentially the same. Now, there's the idea that keeps going around the excellence theory, for example, I'll read on the internet that somebody says, this is an old theory, it's been discredited, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at practice now and I can't see that it's any different than when we did that study or that study isn't just as relevant now as it ever was. So I think we keep reinventing the wheel. I, I think one sees this. I. Actually, the situational theory of publics came from John Dewey, who wrote a book called The Public and Its Problems in the 1920s. So I suppose I reinvented the wheel, but we come up with new ideas. So I think the theories are more relevant today than they ever have been. Uh, publics uh, evolve more than they have, and uh, they evolve in different ways. They can evolve on the Internet and so on, and we need to do that. But I think the way, you know, I, I can see the day where the, the typical thing of trying to place news stories in, journal, in newspapers and so on will be a thing of the past. It's much more effective and efficient to do things on the Internet, to engage publics in the Internet. I think research um, is going to be much more done via, via the Internet. We can... Uh, monitor what people are saying. It's much more easy, it's much easier to do research, I think, because, well, we can do questionnaires and, and, and even focus groups via the internet, via so, uh, new media. Um, and that's not always sure how representative the sample is that we get in that way, but we can do research in that way. But I think that just by monitoring the content and content analyzing the content is of what is on, on uh, digital media, uh, we can do a huge amount of research. You know, people have talked about big data uh, and so on. That that's, I think research is going to be considerably different in public relations uh, with new media. And then I think uh, simply the way we communicate with with publics, whether they be employees or communities or students or anyone, we're going to do it more and more on the internet, on, on social media. And so we're, we have to teach students how to do those things. Uh, I think the nature of the research, the nature of the dialogue, the, the kinds of messages, what we do, that hasn't changed a great deal, but the way we actually uh, implement it, implement those theories is considerably different. You've talked a little bit about looking forward. I'm going to ask you to, to um, look back just a little bit and um, talk a little bit about a, maybe one or two 
I'm going to call them pioneering practitioners who you uh, admire because either they practice uh, in a way that, that you think is, is really um, a, a model for public relations or they espouse certain ideas that, that you really think are important for practitioners today. Well, when I, when I wrote Managing Public Relations, it doesn't seem like too long ago, but it wrote it mostly in 1980 80 to 82, something like that. So what's that, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? Um, I wrote a chapter on history, so I looked for, at least that's how I came up with the four models of public relations and finding ex typical examples of who would practice those models. And so, in a sense, in the, Ivy Lee, I think, was the forerunner of the public information model, and I think there are problems with that model, although what Ivy Lee did at the time was, was very important. And I think Edward Bernays uh, was, was very important for introducing social science into public relations. I think he is essentially a practitioner of the two-way asymmetrical model, which I don't admire that much, but I think uh, he did have social responsibility was important to him, and social science was important to him, and research was important to him, so that was extremely important. Um, perhaps the you know, the, you're representing the Page Center, so Arthur Page has to be, I think, one of the most, if not the most important practitioners of, of public relations. Because if you look at the Page principles, if you look at what he did at AT&T, um, they're really the embodiment of the theories that I've, I've taught and developed. Uh, from social responsibility to symmetrical communication to, I think, Often people think of me mostly as symmetrical communication, but I think the most important public relations theory to me is the strategic management role of public relations, that uh, public relations is involved in decision making and in consuls management before decisions are made, and I think uh, Arthur Page did that to a great deal. And then there's another practitioner that not sure gets the the recognition he deserves that I didn't discover actually until after I had written Managing Public Relations, but I rewrote the history chapter for Managing Public Relations and I never finished writing the book, writing a second edition, but this was Earl Newsom who uh, was practicing in the 1950s. Uh, um, I believe he worked for Ford Motor Company and among others and, and he always saw his role as as a counselor, as a as a public relations firm to put himself out of business. That he would help counsel public relations practitioners in a corporation on how to do public relations so that they wouldn't need to do that. And there's some famous some uh, famous examples of he counseling and again, I believe it was Ford that he counseled to do this, that, that he should provide medical benefits to employees at a time when all of the other companies were fighting the idea because they didn't want to pay for it. And so the rela labor relations were, were much improved as a result of that. Um, then I have, to, I have to, when it comes to public relations education, I think Scott Cutlip is the, the father of public relations education. Um, Scott was my teacher. I, I, when I went to the University of Wisconsin, I had been an undergraduate student at Iowa State University. And actually, I had never taken a public relations course, but in my PhD student program, I sat in on Scott's uh, introductory public relations, public relations theory course. And um, I was studying, at the time I was studying a agricultural journalism at Wisconsin, excuse me, agricultural economics. I'd studied agricultural journalism as an undergraduate, and so, but I wanted to go to work for an agricultural industry and until the Vietnam War came about, and I decided a PhD program was more in my interest than visiting Vietnam at that time. So that's another story, but, but Scott always referred to me as that kid from ag journalism who took my course. Uh, but 
I when Scott won the uh, uh, the uh, research award from AJMC, uh, we did a program for him, uh, and I went back and read the first edition of his textbook and so on, and I could find every concept basically in there that I've used from environmental scanning to management function and so on. It was not as well developed theoretically, but I think Scott set the stage for, for public relations education. And he fought all of the early battles with journalism deans and educators over whether public relations was just applied journalism or whether it was had a theoretical basis of its own. A um, person who was very influential for me was uh, Jim Tyrone at AT&T, uh, and Ed Block at AT&T. Uh, Ed Block was vice president at AT&T at that point. And, he asked Jim Tyrone, who was a researcher, to set up an evaluation research program for AT&T. This was in the 1970s. And I worked with Jim for about a five-year period, and he really instilled in me the idea that the theories had to be practical. And um, he, So it, I learned how to do evaluation research working with him. I think he didn't come in with the ideas, but uh, he had a, he didn't really know how to do evaluation research, and I didn't really know, I knew how to do research, but not necessarily evaluation research. So the two of us working together uh, until he died of a heart attack, I think in about 1979 or something like that, uh, uh, we made a good deal of progress. And so I admire him a great deal. He's someone that, that most people won't uh, won't, whose name we won't mention, but if you mention Marilyn Laurie at AT&T, for example, she will understand him, or Ed Block, and, and so on. Um, Harold Burson I admire a great deal. Um, I think that what he talks about now, I think, are, are very similar concepts. Uh, he used to say, People ask me, what should I say? You know, I could be called in by management and asked, what should I say? And, and now they're called in to say, what should I do? And I think that's, that's an important change. I think uh, Johnson & Johnson, Larry Foster, and Bill Nielsen, who you're going to interview also, it, you know, they, they set a, a, an excellent example. Um, and then there are many, you know, many colleagues who were in public relations education at the same time I was Glenn Broom and David Dozier at San Diego State University. Uh, my wife, Lori Grunig, who worked with me for years and years on the Excellence Project. Uh, uh, John White at the UK and from the UK um, and uh, Fred Repper, who was our practitioner member. Um, all of these, and oh, and I'm overlooking uh, Bill, uh, Bill Ailing at Syracuse University, who was a very important part of the excellence team. Um, Elizabeth Toth, who was then at, at uh, Syracuse and now is at the University of Maryland, and so on. So, um, you know, those are some of my contemporaries who I think um, were sort of this first wave of Scott Cutlip and others like him who kind of basically inaugurated public relations education. And there was a second wave of us who were now about my age and are out of business. And now there's a whole new generation who are doing their thing. And sometimes I like it and sometimes I don't. But. Uh, you've talked a little bit about this, but I want to give you the chance to, to expand on what you've said already if you want to. And that is you've talked about the strategic management role uh, that, that public relations should be part of and the role of public relations um, practitioner as counselor, mm -hmm. management counselor. Uh, is that growing in importance or diminishing in your mind? I think if you look at major corporations, I'm, I'm a member of the Arthur Page Society and to be in the Arthur Page Society you have to be the senior most person in a corporation or a public relations firm. And I, I believe in major corporations, it's essentially universal at this point. 
I think they're all doing that kind of role. Um, government agencies, I'm not so sure. Other organizations that still see public relations more as a publicity or a journalistic role, and they may still be doing that. I mean, that's still part of corporate public relations, but I think the idea that the senior public relations person uh, is a consort of management, I think that's, that's essentially universal. But it, it also goes, I shouldn't say just the senior public relations person, because what I discovered in the last year working on a project with my former student, Jung Nam Kim, looking at how public relations is practiced in Korean organizations, we did some case studies of, of U.S. corporations. And the question was, you know, how do you, what is, how did you get this role? How did you get this strategic management role? What did you have to do to do it? The answer that keeps coming up was develop the expertise to be able to do it, to really understand business, to, to not just how to communicate in the sense of giving out messages, but how to communicate in the sense of doing research, because research is a form of communication. Uh, but also having expertise on decisions that are made. If you're in the financial industry, you have to be able to understand how different forms of mortgages, for example, are going to affect how, uh, people who take out those mortgages, what are going to be the impact on them. And the expertise d isn't just in the senior most person. We sort of have this this image that there's a senior person who does all the management consulting and all the other people in the department are technicians who, who do communicating. But increasingly, I think that expertise, there may be expertise in employee communication or in financial communication or, or in community relations or in particular products or activities uh, that is throughout the organization, so they're, um, they're throughout the public relations department or public relations department. So it's not just one person who has all of that expertise, but everybody. So it and you get that expertise from education, but also from constant listening, from listening just the publics, but also reading about financial information, about reading about. Uh, new products, environmental policies, government policies, and so on. Uh, you don't learn it just by studying how to pitch a news story to the media. You have to really be a policy expertise and have policy expertise. And not everyone can have expertise in everything, so you have to delegate that throughout the public relations department. Now, when it comes to public relations firms, I think you have two types of activities. One is, are those firms, are those parts of firms whose job is mainly delivering messages. Uh, and they're not often involved in strategic decision making. But then there are other parts of firms who are strategic counselors. And there are lots of smaller firms, one person, two person, three person firms who are primarily in business to, to uh, counsel management. Uh, for example, a friend, uh, Fraser Likely, who is a practitioner in, in Canada, in Ottawa, that's, he doesn't necessarily call himself a public relations person. He's a management consultant. So I think there is a great deal of that kind of expertise. But there's still a huge amount of activity, primarily in the marketing communication area, where you're just trying to create buzz and get messages out and... Um, most of which, in my opinion, has no effect, but there's still a huge amount of that, that kind of activity going on. If I'm a young person and, I want, and I, um, I've earned that public relations degree and I'm going out and I'm, I'm now going to be a public relations practitioner, but I aspire to become that, to move into that counseling role and develop the expertise you talked about, what should I do? Uh, well, hopefully it began when you were a student, and not just studying communication or public relations, but studied taking courses in management, taking courses in political science and social science, and developing an interest in, in policy and in management and, and that sort of thing. So 
that's crucial to, to have that interest. And then it's a matter of, of finding the right job. Now, that's not always easy because it's often just finding a job that's important. Uh, and I, I just thought of one of the people I admire the most that I didn't mention, which who is Pat Jackson of Jackson and Jackson and Wagner. I probably learned more from Pat Jackson than anyone else, uh, having worked with him uh, at some time. But this question came up with Pat at one point, and he said what he would recommend is counseling from below. So you may get into one of those positions where you're mostly a messenger and you don't have much of a management uh, role, but if you kind of keep your head above water and constantly think, what would I do if I were in a more senior position and what would I recommend before I'm asked? At some point, someone may ask you or the opportunity may come in the elevator or something in which you're uh, talking with management to ask, you know, to provide that kind of knowledge and that kind of expertise. So um, I think I would also try to be involved in research in whatever way I could. I would want to have wanted the student to have studied it and be competent as a researcher because I think research is the future of public relations and if you can't do research, I don't think you're going to be successful in public relations. So um, actually being involved, there are many, many re public relations research firms or working with them or in them is a good way to gain, gain, uh, ex rele gain uh, expertise and knowledge that could be useful in, in many different ways. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and ask you um, to talk about ethical mission statements or credos. And I want to find out from you, is it, my bottom line question is, is it important for a corporation to have an ethical mission statement or a credo? What does it do? Um, well, if you're, you're going to be interviewing a representative from Johnson & Johnson, which is very famous for its credo, and that has often been attributed. I mean, it's when Johnson & Johnson made the Tylenol decision, it was uh, equated to its, its credo. Um, there's often also a great deal of discussion right now going on in the Arthur Page Society about character and corporate character and how public relations should be the person who, not the person, but the function or the, the role of public relations in the organization should be to help define corporate character. And I get somewhat worried about that because I think credos and statements of character or lists of these are our values. Much of this takes place in, in a committee getting together or somebody writing down what our values are. And I think that this can be taken over by a symbolic interpretive approach. That is, we write down all of these values and we say, this is what we stand for, or this is our credo, but that doesn't show up in the behavior of the organization. So I fundamentally believe that our values are exhibited through our behavior. And so if indeed the credo or the corporate value statement or so on are reflected in values or, excuse me, are reflected in behavior or they are derived from behavior, that is, these are our values because here's what we've done before. They, they shouldn't just be symbols that are put up there to make us look good that we don't actually follow. I think there's much discussion of in a symbolic interpretive approach of what I call a cognitive representation, that is what people think about something. And it's gotten many names, images, reputation, brand, uh, impressions and so on. I don't care what you call it. They're basically all the same thing. That is what members of a public think about an organization. And branding, for example, is the idea is more 
uh, proactive in a sense. A brand is what we want people to identify with our organization where reputation is more what people think after the fact. So um, I tend to believe a brand is our behavior, that our behavior, the organization's behavior brands it. And so when we say, you know, if you've damaged our brand by doing something unethical, that's indeed the case. But somehow thinking up a brand and saying this is the Republican brand, for example. Political parties now have brands, the Republican brand and the Democratic brand and so on. And to me, the brand is more of a marketing than a public relations concept, and I rarely, if ever, use it because it's, it's I think, a symbolic interpretive concept that is used to try to create some kind of meaning for people that doesn't always exist. So this is a long answer to your question, although I think those things are important, but they're less important than day-to-day -day involvement in decision-making. That if we really want public relations wants to influence the character or the ethics of an organization, it does this not by writing statements, but by by advising and participating in decision making and communicating with publics, and then our brand or emerges or our reputation emerges because our reputation is what people remember that the organization did. It's not something we create through publicity. It's what people recall. So if, you know, what is your rep reputation? It's, it's what people remember that an organization did. So that takes you back to the strategic management approach. And I think what's important is to have some sort of statement or some sort of set of principles that say this is the role of the public relations function and this is what we are trying to do and we want to influence character, we want to influence ethics, but we, but public relations has to be a part of decision making of strategic management if it's going to do that. What do you think is the greatest challenge or one of the greatest challenges facing senior public relations executives today and how can it be met? I think the, the greatest challenge comes from uh, the institutionalization of the public relations function or the way it has been institutionalized or the way it needs to be institutionalized. And institutionalization is a, if you go back into sociology and something becomes institutionalized through repeated practice and repeated behavior and then if people do the same things over and over again then, they, then others begin to think that's what it is. So if in the mind, if you, if you did a, an interview on the street uh, and ask people what is public relations, you would get a very different concept of what I think public relations is. And it, because it's become institutionalized as something that is done to people, it's, I think, become institutionalized as a symbolic interpretive approach. That is, what public relations people do is try to make something look good when it isn't, or it's trying to persuade us to do something that is really not in our best interest, or it's trying to create favorable publicity in the media, and you can't trust what a public relations person says, or it's, it's unethical, and so on. Now, I think, to a large extent, that for sure in the media, journalists think of public relations in that way. In their minds, that's the way public relations has become institutionalized. In business schools, for the most part, I think, if you interview the typical business school dean, they will have institutionalized public relations in that way. And I think to some extent, well, particularly in marketing faculties, that's the way public relations has become institutionalized, perhaps less so in management, uh, management faculties and business schools. I think senior management in corporations are increasingly is seeing public relations more as a strategic management function. But 
But still, when when the function is institutionalized as a strate- as a symbolic interpretive approach, it's going to be hard. Say, I, I set up a public relations firm to do something else and to do strategic management counseling, and someone would say, "But that's not public relations." I remember giving an interview at one time in South Africa, and a colleague said, "But does anybody do public relations in that way?" Because in her mind, public relations was media relations and publications and publicity and so on. So I think public relations people still face that challenge. And management consulting firms are moving into and are anxious to take over a, a what they would call stakeholder relations or a stakeholder relations model. And that is public relations. And... Um, and it's if it's institutionalized any other way, then it's th- difficult for public relations to move into to that gap. And I, so I think the challenge would be that someday someone would ask. I always ask my students, "What did your parents say when you told them you wanted to study public relations?" And they all sighed and so on. You know, when when a student said, "I want to study public relations," and they would say. Why would you want to spend your life taking advantage of people instead of saying, well, that's wonderful. You would help make corporations more socially responsible and more ethical and make better decisions. And that hasn't occurred yet. So that's what I mean. When it becomes institutionalized in that way, then I think the public relations will have come of age. Uh, final question, and this brings it back around to you and your career, and that is, what has been the greatest challenge of your professional life? Finding an academic home for public relations. Uh, And I think that goes back to the institutionalization function. I think we are either in journalism schools or in communication, formerly speech communication departments, and each of those units have institutionalized public relations as something different from what I think it is. Um, and so I, I don't think I taught in a journalism school for um, nearly 30 years and in a communication department for nearly 10 years. And I don't think public relations was ever fully understood or accepted in either of those places. In, in journalism, journalism educators tend to think of public relations as applied journalism, and communication people think of it as applied persuasion or organizational communication or something. And I think my role has been, not just me, but many others of my generation, is to create a unique body of knowledge in public relations that is communication oriented but it's not journalism and and it is communication but it's not one of those other communication disciplines. There is something I'd I'd like to mention here, something I haven't mentioned and that's the importance of relationships in public relations. I think the last research that I was doing and many of my students is carrying on now is, is on relationships. And what we did is we looked into communication theory on interpersonal communication and also interpersonal psychology to find out what is known about the nature of relationships, when are relationships uh, good, when are they, are they bad for the people involved. And, and so I think of public relations is about public relationships, and I think that's been very important. Um, And that idea, again, came out of of speech communication. Now, now the challenge is at a time when all of a sudden the concept of reputation has become so popular in public relations. And public relations is a discipline of fads. So it used to be everybody was creating images. Now they're creating reputations. And I think both are cognitive representations, and I don't see a huge amount of difference. I think what's really important are relationships. And so now the challenge has been, how do I break into that sort of mindset that you know we're reputation managers when um, 
Well, first off, I don't think you can manage any outcome like reputation or even relationships. You can only manage the process as a producer reputation. So if you really want to manage your organization's reputation, you have to help manage the organization. And then that will produce behavior which produces a good reputation. But our research has shown, I think, quite strongly that Relations, uh, reputation is essentially a byproduct of the quality of relationships that an organization has with its publics. And that takes us back to the term that um, Edward Bernays said he invented public relations, but it's really relationships with publics. So our key things has been defining what is a public, identifying publics, and determining how best to build relationships with those publics. And I believe that relationships are built best cultivated through symmetrical practices rather than through through asymmetrical practices. And I think that uh, identi one of the key roles of public relations is to identify the stakeholders, or as I would say stakeholder publics, that an organization needs to have relationships with. So the challenge is been to get educators, universities, practitioners to think strategically and to think, I'm not just trying to get my name out there, the organization's name out there, but with whom does this organization truly need a relationship and what's the best means to cultivate that relationship? And again, that takes us back to institutionalizing public relations as that kind of function. All right. Anything you want to add that I didn't ask you about? And I think that if every human being needs relationships to, to survive in the world, and I think every organization does, and public relations is the function that has been even invented to help develop and cultivate relationships. I won't say manage relationships because I don't think you can manage relationships. You can only manage the communication processes that produce relationships. So, And I think that's a really exciting and challenging way to spend one's life is to help organizations develop uh, relationships. And I think that I would hope that uh, young people would be very interested in that role. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was terrific.